In the National Hockey League's new four-division alignment, there are three teams with solid first-place leads. The one-divisional race still unsettled with only three weeks to go on the regular season is a study in contrast. The Vancouver Canucks come skating onto the ice in Chicago Stadium, tied with the Blackhawks for the top spot on the Con Smythe division, and not too many people around the league could have predicted that. Possibly because not too many people around the league had ever heard of many of the players now wearing the Canucks' blue uniforms. The Chicago Blackhawks, on the other hand, still have a, a roster full of established players with names like Stan Mikita, Dennis Ho, Jim Pappen, and goalie Tony Esposito. The winner of tonight's game will take a strong psychological edge into the playoffs if they can hold on to their lead. And the sellout crowd seems to sense the electricity building. Chicago goaltender, number 35, Tony Esposito, year after year in the race for the Vezina Trophy for best goals against average, will be facing an old understudy, ex-teammate Gary Smith. Smith must have learned a lot watching Tony for those two years because he has held this young Vancouver team together all season with the kind of superb goaltending that won him all-star honors at the halfway mark. Their styles are different, but in one area at least, they are very much alike. While most teams now split the goaltending duties between two first-string goalies, Tony Esposito has been in the Chicago net 62 times this year, while Gary Smith has appeared in 65 of the Canucks' 69 games. But I uh, played here for two years uh, with Tony in Chicago, and uh, I just wore number 35 uh, in respect to him uh, one game we were playing in warm-up. And the people thought that I was sort of trying to make a gag out of it, but it was just in respect to him. And I think he's the best goaltender in hockey, and uh, I love the guy. And he's taught me a lot, and uh, he's taken me from a medi mediocre goaltender to a little bit better than mediocre anyway. Well, he taught me, uh, I think, mostly concentration. I used to lose my concentration. Uh, now I concentrate in five-minute cycles. I, I divide the game into 12 uh, five-minute cycles, and I hope that they don't score me in the first five minutes. And even if they do, then I say, well, they're not going to score me the next five minutes. And even if they do, I say they're not going to score in the next five minutes. So I concentrate the whole game like that, and I find that this really helps me. With so much at stake in this game, both teams have an edge of cautiousness to their play as each tries to gain early control of the puck. Less than three minutes gone, Vancouver's Dennis Vervegaard trips J.P. Bortolo just inside the blue line and draws a two-minute penalty that'll give Chicago a one-man advantage while he sits it out of the box. Vancouver's main job here is to keep the Blackhawks from forming an attack, and they'd be content just to keep the puck out of their own zone. Each time Chicago try to break in, the Canucks put up a solid defense inside their blue line and sent the puck back the other way. The Hawks are going without Dennis Hole tonight, their extra-fast left wing with a cannon-like slap shot, and they miss his offensive threat on their power play. Hull has been in and out of that Chicago lineup all year with a string of injuries, and there's no question about it. The Hawks aren't as dangerous without him. With both teams back at equal strength now, the Canucks begin to put their first real pressure on Tony Esposito, and the Chicago fans start searching through their programs to find out the names of these guys who are taking so many shots against their hero. Names like Don Lieber, John Gould, Jerry O'Flaherty, Bobby Lalonde, and Chris Odlipson aren't exactly household words around Chicago, but they've been scoring the goals that have kept the Canucks hot all year. And midway through the first period, one of those names, center Jerry O'Flaherty, flips the loose puck over the prostrate Esposito, and Vancouver takes a 1-0 lead at 9.46. The replay shows how the young Canuck took a pass from the point and found some empty net over Esposito's fallen body. Vancouver leads Chicago in their season series so far with three wins against two losses. But all their wins have come at home with their own fans cheering for them, and they'd love to prove they could beat the Hawks on Chicago ice. So they continue to force the play, taking advantage of their first goal's momentum. Every time 
Chicago seems about to break through on an attack. Vancouver's defense swarms around the puck carrier, and they work to clear out of their zone. And whenever they have the man advantage following Chicago penalties, they move quickly, chasing the puck into Blackhawk territory and keeping it there with some very aggressive forechecking, doing the kinds of things other teams used to do to them when they occupied their customary position of last place. Second period, the Blackhawks, especially their tough defenseman, number three, Keith Magnuson, began to throw their weight around, trying to slow down the high-flying Canucks by not giving them the chance to set up their attack. The Hawks couldn't seem to get their own offense on track, and Vancouver was constantly able to renew its pressure in the Chicago zone. until finally Chicago's traditional heart-checking defense began to wear down Vancouver's speedy but lightweight forwards, and the Blackhawks started to come on. With a little over four minutes played in the period, Chicago's Phil Russell trading passes with Jermaine Gagnon and Pitt Martin sprints over the blue line behind the Vancouver defense and puts the puck past the sprawling Canuck goalie to tie it up at one all. But in the replay, we see what Russell's sliding goal did to Gary Smith, who had to come out to stop him. He stopped everything except the puck and Russell's knee, and from that moment on, goaltender Gary Smith was in a fuzzy world all his own. No one noticed it at first, but Smith wasn't quite sure where he was exactly or what those strange noises were that kept reverberating around and around inside his head. The first thing they do when a player seems dazed after a collision like that is to ask him his name. When Smith looked up and replied, I'm Alexander the Great, Emperor of all Europe and King of Asia, referee Art Scove knew he had to get him off the ice for a while. Yes, uh, my mind is a little bit foggy right now. Uh, uh, all I remember was Phil Russell was falling down with the puck in front of him coming towards me, and I went down to try and block him, and I felt my mask flew off somewhere, and I saw the puck in the net, and then I tried to get up, and uh, everything was just going, sort of going like this. And then the doctors say that I have a slight concussion. Despite the hard jolt he took, Smith is okay, but Vancouver replaced him in the nets with backup goalie Ken Lockett. And according to a new league rule just adopted this year, the incoming goalie isn't allowed any time to warm up. So Lockett, in only his first year in the National Hockey League, faces the enormous challenge of coming in cold to a 1-1 hockey game. The Blackhawks know how critical a new goalie's first few saves are, and they test Lockett early. Facing two men alone, he forces Cliff Carl to pass the puck and then slides over to block Makita's point-blank shot as his teammates rush over to freeze the puck along the corner boards and take some of the pressure off their young goalie. And one of the best ways to take the pressure off your goalie is to put pressure on the other goalie as Vancouver storms down to the Chicago end of the rink and works to keep it there with a series of hard shots against Tony Esposito. Ludlison passes out to number four, Ab DeMarco, but Chicago's Pitt Martin intercepts and races along the side for a breakaway against Lockett at the other end. A save, and Vancouver clears, bringing it back again into the Chicago zone. DeMarco carrying and shooting from just outside the blue line. 
Chicago is a man down here with Keith Magnuson sitting in the penalty box for two minutes. So all they want to do is play solid defense until both sides are even again. The Hawks try to freeze the puck as the action gets rougher when Magnuson returns and so many bodies come together in one small space. Down at the other end now, it's Chicago's turn to hammer away at Vancouver's goal in the seesaw battle of two hard skating teams. just past the midpoint of this game when Vancouver breaks the 1-1 tie by starting a rush from its own zone that ends with Jerry O'Flaherty getting his second goal of the game as he taps in Burbergott's perfect goal mouth pass. O'Flaherty's 19th goal of the season puts Vancouver on top 2-1 at 13-44. And as we see in the replay, the Canucks connected with some beautiful passing that forced goalie Esposito to leave most of his net wide open. So-called no-name team from Western Canada is yet another expansion club reaching maturity this year. And they quickly jump to a 3-1 lead when little Bobby Lalonde takes the puck at the red line and slaps it past Esposito from 60 feet out. The game was now at a critical point. The young Canucks were sky high, leading the team that had dominated them for so many years and seemingly on their way to sole possession of first place. For Chicago, the time had come to reach down and touch their strength, to find the combination of drive and experience that could still turn this game around. And to veterans like 10-time All-Star, number 21, Stan Mikita, it was time to pull out all the stops to prove they could still work the old magic. The Blackhawks would have one more period to save this game. 20 minutes more to do the things they knew they had to do. And as the Hawks have things to say between periods, the Canucks also talk to each other about how they couldn't let down, about how important it was for them to keep pouring it on. And in the opening minutes of that final period, both teams skated at full speed, neither willing to concentrate so hard on defense that they neglect the need to score that important goal. But it was Chicago who seemed to have the early momentum, and it was Chicago who broke through and scored first, as Jim Tappan took Ivan Boulder at speed right off a of faceoff and pulled the Hawks to within one goal only four minutes into the period. The Chicago fans had seen their team win in clutch situations before, and they screamed and cheered, wanting to see them do it again now. The game got rougher as the pressure kept building, and buddies hit the ice with each flurry around the net. The growing pride 
of this young Vancouver club was matched against the pride of a veteran Chicago team. And the last tense minutes ticked away as if both teams were already locked in a playoff game. were exploding all over the ice now, and the checking became ferocious as each club had its chances to score. Chicago pressed for the tying goal, but Doug Jarrett's slap shot is blocked and sends two Canucks in on Tony Esposito, who comes up with a dazzling save on Paulin Bordalo's close-in shot. comes Chicago, Pitt Martin carrying it across the blue line, but the Vancouver defense pokes the puck off his stick. Bordalo beats up to John Gould, and the young winger dashes in alone to beat Esposito on the short side. And with less than four minutes to play, the Canucks go ahead 4-2. Not over yet, a little over a minute left. Chicago pulls their goalie to put another attacker on the ice. And with the net left unguarded at the other end of the rink, they keep control of the puck and feed it to Russell, who scores again. And incredibly, Chicago still has a chance. on Vancouver's rookie goaltender Ken Lockett is tremendous and the Hawks still with their net empty have 52 seconds to keep shooting. Marx fires it in. The puck goes behind the cage. Two Hawks chasing it. It's set it out in front. A shot off to the side. They battle for it. The loose puck squirting dangerously around in front as Russell and Vancouver's Tracy Pratt wrestle to the ice. But the excited Canucks hang on, and the sweet 4-3 victory becomes theirs. Well, I'll tell you, Kenny Lockett, uh, when I got hurt there, went in and just played fantastic. Uh, I was sitting on the bench, and uh, I couldn't believe it, you know. Uh, He's played well all year, but he hasn't had that much chance to show what he can do. And uh, he certainly played great tonight, and uh, we can thank him for the two points that we got. And these are going to end up being, at this point in the schedule, uh, very important two points, believe me.